this week on Just Solutions. The Black Agenda, Bold Solutions for a Broken System, is a new collection of essays written by black scholars addressing a variety of issues from the climate crisis, education, healthcare, the criminal justice system and more. The book is edited by Anna Gifty Opoku Ajman, co-founder of the Sadie Collective, a non-profit that addresses the underrepresentation of black women in economics and finance. In the introduction to the book, Anna Gifty writes, the Black Agenda is a love letter to black experts whose work often goes unnoticed, especially in areas of public discourse that disproportionately impact black life. From Free Speech TV, Just Solutions. Anna, it's so great to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, the book I know came out of, I guess, your frustration at the certainly the start of the COVID pandemic when it was very obvious that black communities were disproportionately impacted by what was going on across the board from healthcare to economics. And yet black experts, black voices were not being platformed. They were not being heard, certainly in the mainstream. So, so take us back to why you wanted to actually have this collection of essays, The Black Agenda. First of all, thank you so much for having me here on the show. I'm so excited to be talking with you today, Maeve. So really the Black agenda was born out of exactly what you're talking about, the lack of Black voices being centered during the pandemic, right? So we think about the fact that, you know, we're going through this catastrophic event that's affecting everybody across the world. And the experts that are really driving that conversation don't look like the world that are being disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And so really that was part of the reason where I was looking at kind of, you know, the lack of black expertise being cited, the lack of black experts being featured on television channels such as this one. And I would say not even just this one, but like CNN, MSNBC, a number of different places, right? Um, just because we really wanna make sure that, you know, when we're talking about black expertise, that that's actually engrossed into the conversation. And so that was one of the main reasons. I would say the other reason is that, you know, as somebody who did co-found the Sadie Collective and is a little bit more visible in the economic space, people were reaching out to me. They were like, what do you think about what's going on economically? And it's look, I can give you my two cents, but I am still a student, right? And there's a lot of more people who are a bit more qualified than I am or even more so qualified than I am. And so those are the individuals that I really wanted to see be centered in this. Well, the idea that we need to centre Black voices and Black expertise, not just for the sake of Black communities, but really for the sake of society, yes. I think it's exemplified and, and described very well in the foreword to the book, which is written by Dr. Tressie Macmillan Cotton. And she says that when you move the conversations about Black lives and Black experiences to the centre and those discussions about equity and inequality, it's just going to be better for everybody. That's exactly right. This idea of the best outcome for Black people is a better outcome for everyone else. It's sort of the ethos of the book, right? Saying, look, if Black life is criminalized, then everybody is at risk. And so the way that the solutions are built around um, the book itself is kind of advocating for that sort of ethos in every single sector of society. There are so many different sectors that are covered from the climate crisis to maternal health care, overall health care, mental health, yes. uh, education, the economy. And race runs through it all because it shows you how deeply systemic in nature racism is. And yet we're at a time right now where the actual topic of racism is right. off the table in schools. We're right. seeing this yeah. backlash really about discussion of the black experience being banned in schools. And this is the time that your book is coming out. I mean, what are right. your thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, someone mentioned when the book was first announced um, on February 1st, this book is about to get banned in Florida. And I was like, Probably, right? Like it's literally <laughs> called the Black Agenda. Someone's gonna find it and be like, why is this something that's in my library, in my classroom? But I think that's exactly right. You know, we're talking about racism in a big, broad way, especially following sort of the temporary racial reckoning of 2020, right? Following George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's untimely passing. And so that being said, the conversation around what does it mean to be Black in America and what does it mean to be Black and human, right? Because I think that that is really the core of this discussion, that Black people are dehumanized. Our, va our, our value is, you know, non-existent within the context of the American country. And I would argue, too, in, in the more Western um, context, right? And so that being said, um, it's interesting to see people kind of saying, look, 
we don't want to be uncomfortable about the history that you know lines the pockets of the most powerful and that is quite literally woven to the fabric of the american democracy right and so we don't want to grapple with that so we're just not going to and what people don't recognize is that there's a lack of empathy in that statement right this idea of i don't want to be uncomfortable so i don't want to talk about it but the only history that black americans get in particular around their um their role in this society is very much rooted in trauma first of all slavery followed by jim crow followed by years of segregation now we're talking about the prison industrial complex and you think about even researchers and experts that are you know amplified and and centered that are white in studying these topics right they're oftentimes given a platform to talk about these ideas whether or not they're harmful and so that being said right we can't have this inconsistency in terms of what kind of history we're covering. And that's why, you know, in our suggested readings um, in the back of the book, I mentioned the 1619 Project. I mentioned how the world has passed with Clint Smith, right? Because these are important books that ultimately contextualize what's going on with the history debate and why it ultimately needs to honor Black life. That idea that we're not recognizing Black expertise or honoring and celebrating Black brilliance in many ways, it reminded me when I was reading one of the essays in particular, and I know this is close to your heart, the one by Dr. Lauren Mims on the uh, brilliance of Black girls. But yes. I, I, it reminded me of an interview that we just did with the uh, Zinn Education Project on how reconstruction is not being taught in right. schools. And one of the consequences of that is that the incredible energy and political aid agency that black people had in that post-civil war uh, time is right. not being recognized or taught and so what we're hearing instead are just the negative the the trauma laden aspects right. of black history and how that has a very serious impact yeah. on black students so then when i was reading that essay the brilliance of black girls take us through the opening of that because it's just a very poignant scene where Dr. Mims describes this uh, classroom where these black girls have such negative ideas about themselves. Talk about that essay. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Dr. Lauren Mims, for those who don't know, is a psychologist. She has her PhD in psychology and she's also somebody who does quite a bit of research on how black girls sort of take up different messages across society. And so in her essay, which is on the brilliance of black girls, as Maeve just mentioned, she kind of walks us through a scenario in which she was leading a classroom of young black women, um, black girls and black women rather, right? And so she's in this classroom and these women have been invited to be part of a program. They don't know exactly why they've been invited. And so she asks them, you know, why do you think you're here? And so they start, shouting out and she starts writing down different phrases about why they think they're here. One of them says, because I'm a single mother. One of them says, because I'm loud and disruptive. Another one says, because, you know, I don't know what I want to do with my life. All of these disparaging things about themselves. And so for me, every time I read the essay, it brings me to tears because a lot of times I see myself as, you know, just a younger black woman in a classroom. And so, you know, thinking about how the systemic, I would say, um, overtones of what we see with racism and sexism are embedded into society. And then you see in this essay how it's sort of ingrained and internalized by individuals. It's heartbreaking. And so she takes in these disparaging comments from the black girls in the classroom. And after she's done, right, after they're done, she takes a chalk and she crosses out each disparaging comment and replaces it with something positive. So for the single mother, she says, you're, you're a mother with priorities and you wanna get your education. Um, with someone who says that their loudness is disruptive, she says, you're opinionated and you wanna be heard. All of these types of you know different um, affirming comments that kind of counter what has been taught and institutionalized by what we're seeing with racism and sexism across the board. And then what ends up happening is a shift and it's almost immediate. The girls look up and they say, wait, so this is a special program for black girls who are ambitious and excited about, you know, pursuing a career and pursuing their education. She's like, yes, yes. Right. And so I think for me, that was just a, such a salient example of 
how does language and how does recentering the conversation on black life and black value ultimately have um, on the the black communities that ultimately need to be to be affected in a positive way? And so we see that in real time with this essay on the brilliance of black girls. I'd imagine that must have been quite poignant for you to read yes. that. I mean, your own experience here in in at the U.S. I mean, you came here as a baby with your family yes. from Ghana. I think you were in a Head Start program, and then you yeah. uh, successfully got a scholarship. You were offered a scholarship in recognition of your work to to yeah. a private school. You're at the Harvard Kennedy School now, doing a PhD. Yeah. I mean, you've had to fight your space. You've been that black girl, I'm sure, in these white spaces. Yes. But, you know, talk about your own personal experience and how it relates to to that essay, but some of the other essays in the book. Absolutely, I think that you know you're you're hitting on a number of different points here. I got a front row seat into seeing economic inequality as a five-year-old. So the story goes that, you know, I was part of the Head Start program. My family at the time was low income working. And so we were eligible for the program. And so essentially at the end of graduation, my parents were given an opportunity. There was a new private school being built in the area and they were looking for students to admit. And they had essentially come to that Head Start and said, look, we wanna admit one student here we want to give them the full ride and we want to just support them through their educational journey. My principal at the time, Miss Anna Puma, shout out to Miss Anna Puma. She met with my parents. She said there was something about my parents and she was sold. And so I essentially became the first black girl to be admitted into my elementary school and later on the first black student to graduate from my elementary school. And so when we talk about being the only one, it's really a matter of navigating a space in which privilege, whiteness, wealth, all of these things sort of intersect to create something somewhat toxic, right? You're trying to be yourself, but you're trying to figure out who you are amidst individuals who look nothing like you. And so as a young person, I would go home to my low income neighborhood in which my backyard was a slab of concrete. And then I would have play dates with my white friends who lived in these sprawling lawn, single family homes, cul-de-sacs, right? And I'm like, are they living in mansions? Like, what is this, right? And so for me, that was a, I would say a jumping off point in how I was trying to understand the world. Why am I living a completely different life than my peers? And that only became more salient and more real as I got older, where, you know, I went to another private school. This time, my classmates were even wealthier. I went to school with individuals who rented out Raven stadiums for their bar mitzvahs, right? And so kind of getting a sense of, what does wealth look like on a massive scale? And why is my community not seeing this kind of wealth? It led me to ask questions, which ultimately led me to seek out answers from individuals like the ones featured in this book. Well, even now you're in grad school, you're doing your PhD and yeah. economics is your field. That's a very white field. It's also it a very male field. Yeah. So you're up against many, many layers. And of course, yeah. the, you know, the Sadie Collective is 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 designed and, and was created to, to help women in these areas, particularly right. black women. So, you know, your experience now and having that knowledge of everything that you've lived through, I would imagine that you just it, it you see things in a way that white academics and white economists who don't have that lived experience just there, there have to be so many blind spots for them. One hundred percent. I would say always there's a difference between studying racial inequality and living through it. And we need experts who actually can do both. And that's essentially what the Black Agenda book makes a case for. Individuals who understand what inequality looks like on the ground because they've lived through it. And then those same individuals then have the tools they need to empirically you know, evaluate what's going on on the ground and what's going on on a macro scale. And so to your point about my experience in economics, yes, economics is uniquely white, uniquely male in the sense that a lot of privilege is sort of being overlapped in this field. And you know, it's always interesting to me how power is concentrated, right? Economics is a field in which many people wouldn't know this. They are, in my opinion, the powerhouses behind a lot of leaders across our world. The le leaders that you're seeing like presidents and, and global leaders and folks in the UN, a lot of the analysis in which they're basing their decisions on are based off of the analyses, um, excuse me, um, conducted by economists, right? Conducted by people who understand data. And the way that you ask your questions, the way that you evaluate data, that matters too, right? And you can, you know, be very 
I would say creative about how you interpret certain things, right? You can interpret certain results as being more harmful to communities or being helpful to communities. And those communities in which it's harmful or helpful to can have catastrophic impacts on what you decide to put value on. And so for me, being you know one of the few black women in the field, being a visible black woman in economics, it doesn't come without its woes. There's definitely people who look at me and they are super annoyed by anything that I do. If I breathe, oh my gosh, why is it breathing, right? Um, but at the end of the day, I understand that this work is not about me. It's not about who I am in this space and individually, it's about our collective effort. It's about the next generation, it's about legacy. And I always say that if you are not leaving room or if you're not leaving places better than how you found them, then did you even enter the place in the first place, right? So this is idea of creating pathways, lifting as you climb and ensuring that the next generation is better off. Well, we would love to hear from our viewers. Let us know your thoughts on this. Join the conversation. Engage with us on social media. Drop a comment. And of course, uh, let us know if you have any thoughts on this and if any of these areas are resonating with you. But um, Anna, getting back to this idea that Black yeah. expert voices were essentially marginalized, and it's not yeah. just during COVID. It was very obvious during COVID, Absolutely. but it's been you know, all the time. We're at a time right now where Joe Biden is committed to having a black woman serve on the Supreme yes. Court. And I know, everybody knows that in the confirmation hearings, there will be maybe coded language, maybe very overt language mm -hmm. about, well, why are you here? Are you just here because we're ticking a box? And I'm, I'm remembering yeah. the Sonia Sotomayor hearing where I can't remember which Republican uh, on the, the uh, committee asked her, well, how can you put aside your experience of being that, you know, a Latina and, and have no bias coming to this as if white people don't have the weight of all our whiteness yeah. as a bias? I mean, I, I know we're going to be having these conversations. So when we 100%. talk about the need to have black experts, that there are so many layers to that as well, yeah, because yeah. it not only is the space not there for them, yeah. when space is created, they're up mm -hmm. against a lot as well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, you know, when people have this conversation around diversity, they make it seem like diversity is a substitute for merit. When in fact, black and brown folks usually have to work thrice as hard, right? We have to work thrice as hard just to be seen. So, you know, what you're talking about now with, you know, the Black women being potentially uh, nominated for the Supreme Court, a lot of people are looking at it as a diversity pick. But from my understanding, Black women make up a substantial part of the United States and co will continue to be, you know, um, I would say forerunners in how we think about public policy from here on out. We also know that Black women were critical to the Democrats cinching the election. So it doesn't make sense as to why the, the idea of a black woman being the Supreme Court should be questioned. It It's long overdue, right? And I would say that what we're seeing around those conversations has actually been previewed by what's happening with Dr. Lisa D. Cook, who is an economist that's currently up for another historic role as the first black woman in the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. For those who are not familiar with the Fed, the Fed essentially manages the health of our economy. They're the ones who set the interest rates, they're the ones who issue bonds, excuse me, and a number of different economic activities that ensure that the health of the US economy flourishes in the global um, economic landscape. And so that being said, we're already seeing things around her where people are like, are you really good at macroeconomics? She's, they're talking to a whole macroeconomist, Maeve, <laughs> right? She's been in the game for a long time. She's worked for the White House. She's worked for the Council of Economic Advisors. She's worked for the Treasury Department. She's worked as a professor. She has publications. She is a mentor. She's an educator. There is no shortage of experience. But I always say that no amount of experience will erase whether or not someone wants to be discriminatory and biased against a certain person, right? You can have years of experience, you can have decades of experience, but if they already assume your incompetence as the baseline, there is no getting away from that. And so for those who are questioning whether or not a black woman should be in the Supreme Court, the real question should be, why shouldn't a black woman be in the Supreme Court? You know, I always say that, you know, this is going off of a concept that is illustrated in the essay Black Women Best within um, the book, right? It's, it's coined by Janelle Jones as a framework, but the idea that the best outcome for Black women is a better outcome for everyone else. It's an extension of what I said before. This is exactly it. You know, Black women, at the end of the day, we are at the intersection of so many marginalized identities. And so when we think about a Black woman being the Supreme Court, 
one, we need a black woman who's going to center black and brown people, first and foremost, right? People are just like, let's throw out some names. It's like, no, 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 no. We got to make sure that the black woman who is actually occupying this essentially permanent role is going to be one who can actually advocate and stand in for black and brown communities at the highest court of the land. But the other thing that we have to recognize too is that solutions that are centered on black women in particular have always led to better outcomes for everyone else, right? If we think about even the pay gap as it stands right now, black women have what, 62 to 63 cents to the dollar of a white guy. If we close that gap for black women, we actually close the gap for white women. We also close that gap for Asian women and the average woman overall, while substantially closing that gap for Latinas and Native American and indigenous folks. So this idea of having black women at the center of leadership, I think that is essentially what President Biden is trying to push out here. And I definitely agree with him on that. Well, as we mentioned, race is the real commonality across all of right. these essays that deal with the climate crisis, education, healthcare, the, the economy, but of course the criminal justice system, because yes. it is so deeply rooted in the systemic nature of, of the racist aspect of our current criminal justice yes. system. And really the 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 theme I so as well through all of these essays was yeah. all of these black experts saying recognize the humanity of black people and when you look at this in the context of what's happening right now in the criminal justice system where being black in and of itself is almost illegal and could get you killed just that's exactly being right. black yeah that's exactly right it is illegal to be black in america right now what do i mean by that i mean literally our rights are being debated <laughs> like right our rights to vote our right to live, whether or not we are able to even go into a store, whether or not we're able to even just exist, right? You're having a barbecue somewhere, all of a sudden someone just called the police saying, why are these black people here? This idea of black existence being criminalized is not going to help anyone. I always say that black folks in America in particular are a proxy for what's going to happen to the nation. You mistreat black folks, everybody is eventually going to get mistreated. Let me give you a salient example of what I'm talking about. The 2008 financial crisis, we know about it. Um, I was actually in fifth grade at the time. <laughs> so, you know, for some folks who might be looking at me like, she definitely didn't know about it. I was aware of it. And I definitely have become more aware of it as I've gotten more interested in economics and policy. But ultimately, what we find is that if you actually look around 2006, 2007, Black economists were ringing the alarm and saying, look, Something is coming. Our communities are being subjected to predatory loans. We're seeing a number of foreclosures increasing over time. Something is coming and something is coming that is big and we need to address it now. They were flagging it for the Fed. The Fed wasn't paying attention or the Fed was maybe ignoring them at the time. And 2008 happens. So what we see then is what was happening in the black and brown communities was actually you know, a worse situation of what was going to happen to the nation in a couple of years. And we kind of even see this with the pandemic, right? Where you see a bunch of black and brown folks being like leaving the labor force or having higher unemployment rates. And then we see that that is essentially being reflected in the nation a couple months later or about a year later. And what's also unfortunate is that you then see that any sort of recovery efforts that are put forth, whether it be in the economy, whether it be in climate, whether it be in healthcare, often always leaves black and brown people behind. And the thing is, you know, at the end of the day, when we're thinking about solutions, when we're thinking about ways to, you know, bridge the gap between how we think about black life being criminalized, at the end of the day, it's all about whether or not you see black people as human. If you see black people as human, your policies reflect that. The ways that you move reflect that. The way that you conduct business reflects that. And I think that People like to, you know, dance around that reality of whether or not they treat black people as human. If you assume that I'm already incompetent, if you assume that I already don't deserve to live, if you assume that I'm already a criminal from the moment you meet me, I've lost this conversation. There's nothing I can say to you that will justify my humanity to you because you've already made assumptions about whether or not I deserve to exist. There's so much intersectionality across all of these essays, you know, how criminal justice intersects with the climate, intersects with right. healthcare, right. intersects with so many things. But there was one very stark example in one of the essays on the climate crisis about, uh, and, and the author calls for more collaboration between the abolitionist movement and yes. environmentalists because people who are incarcerated are much more vulnerable to the impacts 
of the climate crisis. And that right. is not a perspective I had actually heard before. Yes. I love that essay. It's, you know, Intersectional Environmentalism is by Abigail Thomas. And she is somebody who really illustrates beautifully, beautifully for us, excuse me, how the climate justice movement must tie in with the abolition movement. Regardless of how you feel about abolition, it's something worth considering. She says, look, building more prisons doesn't help the environment. In fact, it increases carbon emissions, which is something that you don't actually hear about when folks are talking about the climate crisis movement, how criminal justice plays a huge role in increasing our likelihood of having a catastrophic climate crisis. The other thing that she also mentions as well is that you know the way that black and brown communities are situated relative to environmentally toxic waste sites is something that is also concerning. If you think about the criminal justice system as being disproportionately black and brown, and then you think about the fact that over 589 federal or state prisons are situated right next to an environmentally toxic wig site, that is crazy. The fact that, you know, the only time you have um, to, to breathe fresh air as someone who is incarcerated is right next to an environmentally toxic waste site. That is what I mean by not viewing certain individuals as human. That is fundamental to how we're thinking about the climate crisis. I would also say that her essay is complementary to the other essays in that chapter. Dr. Marshall Shepard talks about, look, where you live matters. If you live in a neighborhood that is disproportionately black and brown, chances are your neighborhood is going to be hotter. And that is something that we've actually seen anecdotally where people have to you know, stay outside or schools have to close prematurely because the air conditioning is not working. And that is directly tied to redlining and a lot of the racist laws that were implemented in the early 1900s to ensure that black and brown communities did not get resources. So for me, I'm looking at the climate movement as integrative of all the other aspects of society, right? If we wanna see, um, progress on that front, we actually have to begin with Black people, as Mary Anise Hagler talks about. Stop all lives mattering the climate crisis. It's not just about polar bears and, you know, paper straws. It's about actual life. It's about lives, about communities, and it's happening globally. And that's something that we need to recognize. Well, there is so much in the book, The Black Agenda, so many incredible essays, also incredible references and reading lists. Yes for people who are interested and really everybody should be interested in all of this, because as you said, this impacts everybody, yes. you know, but what in the last few minutes that we have, Anna, what yeah. would you like to see come out of this book? It's just been released. It's very exciting, but what would you like to see coming out of us? So first and foremost, I would love to see some of the experts on here. So I'm looking forward to seeing them being on broadcast on, you know, podcasts, a number of different news outlets. I think that that was the main intention of this book. How do we bring these experts to the forefront of the mainstream? So they are literally hard to ignore, right? You have to cite them because they're out there. So I would say that's the first thing. The second thing is I want to see this book on President Biden's desk. I've said that to a number of different individuals and I think we can get it there. I think he would be willing to read this book. Um, it's a kind of book where if you're looking for empirical evidence to justify why things like Build Back Better are good for the entire population, this book gives you a number of different reasons why. It's also a book that serves as a resource for any bold policies that might seem popular with everyone, but ultimately might not be popular with congressional leaders or folks who are in power, right? Things like forgiving student debt, for example, right? There's an entire essay by Dr. Fenaba Addo where she talks about that. Um, she says, look, it's tied directly to black generational wealth. You want black people to have generational wealth in this country? You're gonna forgive student debt. That is exactly what we wanna see. The other thing I wanna see in practice is how um, certain chapters are gonna be used in real time. The healthcare chapter being one of them, right? Uh, where we have conversations around caregiving, we have conversations around the actual framework of healthcare, but we also have conversations around wellness. You mentioned Mental Health for Black America by Jave Grooms, it's Tinu Abiyemi Paul's essay about disability, being a disabled Black woman in America and how policies can be constructed around the betterment of that, right? But we also want to see things happening with economics and the public policy movement that we're seeing, right? Voting rights right now is a contentious topic. And at the end of the day, in my opinion, it is the catalyst for a lot of these so solutions, excuse me, getting into the mainstream. And so Cliff Albright's essay for me is really top priority. How do we ensure that Black people have a vote and that our vote has power at the ballot? And so that's something that I would definitely want to see moving forward. 
Well, the book is The Black Agenda. Anna, thank you so much for being with us on Just Solutions. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And don't forget that Just Solutions is also available as a podcast. So you can subscribe to it wherever you get your podcasts and never miss an episode. And join us again next week, same time, same place for another conversation from Free Speech TV, Just Solutions.